Just to let you know what we're doing, my name is Ray Davidson. I'm pastor of the First Southern Baptist Church uh, here in uh, St. John on the corner of Second and Exchange. Uh, we would like to have any of you that are watching come and join us on Sunday mornings at 9.30 in our worship service. Uh, the gentleman who sang before me, many of you probably know if you've uh, been around St. John for a while, that's Bill Clausing. Uh, he leads our music. And beginning this day, the first uh, Sunday of September, we're starting a 31-week study on the story. It's a book that we are using. It is the Bible and the New International Version, but it has no uh, chapters or verses in it. It's written kind of like a story. It's for us to sit and to read. Uh, during the week, we will be reading a chapter at a time of about 12 pages. It consists of uh, uh, New International Version, uh, Bible stories and things, uh, and some comments that are made to help uh, in continuity. And we're going to look at how God's story has affected man's story in our lives. From the beginning, when God created, all the way to the end, when Jesus Christ is coming back again. And we're going to do it chronologically. And uh, we're going to look at uh, different events that occur. So I invite you to join us. Uh, we're going to be on Channel 3 at uh, uh, each Monday evening uh, following the 7.30 news broadcast. And it will also be on the Internet. And uh, uh, those of you who have been using the Internet with the uh, Sandy, Sandyland Center, is that correct? Uh, dot org. Uh, you'll be able to, to, to find the messages uh, on the internet. Uh, at 10.30 on Sunday mornings, we will be doing Sunday school, and we'll be talking about the story there also, and looking at how it impacts our lives. The story is God's story. It has three levels, or actually two levels. It's the, there's the upper story of what God is doing in the universe, what God has been doing from the beginning of time. We also not only have the upper story, but we have the lower story. How man has reacted to and engaged with God at different times throughout the history of the Scriptures and up to the present time. And so we have the upper story, the lower story, and then we're going to relate it so that it becomes part of our story. So that's what we're going to be doing for the next 31 weeks. And uh, since we don't have chapters and verses in the, in, in the book that we're reading, and if any of you would like to get a copy of the book, you can come to the church on Sunday and, and see us and pick up a copy, or you can see Bill Palsy, uh, or go to the gym at the Shepherd Center, and we can get you a copy of the book so that you can read along and study with us. So that's the long announcement that I won't be doing anymore, <laughs> but just to let people know uh, who have joined us by television what we are doing. God's story. The upper level story. God has always been. He always will be. God has no beginning and no end. And the Bible nowhere seeks to prove the existence of God. God is. God exists. And the story relates what God has done for the universe, for the earth, for you and for me. God created a place, a perfect place, for human beings to live. God spoke, and the Big Bang occurred. When God spoke, the world came into existence. And over a period of seven days, or six days, God spoke, and as He spoke, He prepared a place 
for mankind to live. The scripture says that He created the sun and the moon. And for those two can't think of a word. For those two bodies in the sky, one was for the day and one was for the night. And when He created those, He mentioned at that point in time and thought at that point in time as we find in the Scripture that they were for the holy days, the sacred days, to set apart sacred time. And then God went on to create the animals. He created the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, the animals on the land, the creepy crawly animals. He created all of the uh, plants that we have on earth today. God created a perfect place. When He created the animals, He created domestic animals as well as wild animals. Because He speaks of the cattle. Something that was prepared for you and for me as human beings. God also took the time to not create man as He spoke into existence the other things. For when the Scripture tells us God spoke, it occurred. But when it came time to make man, God took the dust from the ground, the dirt from the ground, and He patiently formed man. He didn't speak man into existence as He did the other things. But God patiently put man together and then He gave that man life. He breathed into the man the breath of life. And man became a living creature. A living being. And God brought all of the animals that He had created before the man. And He had the man name all of the animals. But in doing so, there was not one of the animals that was found that would be proper for the man to have. So the man was alone. And God then put the man into a deep sleep and He took one of the ribs from his side and He created woman. Because she was taken from the man. And God gave the man and the woman, the responsibility of caring for all of the creation that God had made. He put them into a special place called the Garden of Eden. And there He was providing for them. And there, each day, each evening, God came down and walked with man and with woman. They fellowship with God. Of all of the things that God created, Man is the only one who can communicate with God. Mankind is the only one of the creation of God that is able to communicate with Him and to speak with Him and to enjoy His fellowship. And for a period of time, God came each evening and He worked and He talked with the man and the woman. But then something happened. One of the creatures that God had created was taken over by a, a, a spirit called the devil or Satan. And the snake went to the woman and to the man and began to speak to them. So God has on His upper level has created a perfect place for mankind to live. He has created a place and a people that He can communicate with and that can communicate with Him. But in the midst of doing that, God looked and He saw what was going to happen. 
he knew what was going to happen to begin with, and, and we, we can't understand all that there is to know about God. And it's not even be, uh, possible to begin, but, but, but this serpent came to the man and the woman and began to talk to them and to tempt them to challenge their thinking, to challenge their understanding of the God who had been walking with them every day. The serpent asked, did God really say that you cannot eat from any of the trees of the garden? On page 5 of the book, you'll see these temptations that Satan put before the man and the woman. He got them to thinking, what did God really say? God had said you can eat of any tree you want to except one tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Satan comes and he says, did God really say that you can do this? He began to create a doubt in the mind of the people. And the woman, when she responded to Satan, took God's Word and added to it what her understanding was. She said, yeah, we can, we can eat of all of the trees, but we can't eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and we cannot even touch it. You see, mankind had already begun to add to God's Word. First, you doubt what God really said. Then, you question or say or add to what God said. And you put your own spin on it. And the woman said, God said, if you touch the tree, you will die. And the serpent said, You're a God is a liar. You're not going to die if you eat of this fruit. You will not certainly die, for God knows that when you eat it, eat of this fruit, you are going to become like God. God's a liar. And you know, He's keeping something from you. He's keeping you from knowing good and evil. He's keeping you from being God. So therefore, God's keeping something from you. And the woman looked at the tree and she saw, hey, it's good for food. It's pleasing to the sight. And it's desirable for gaining wisdom. Boy, all I have to do is I can take this beautiful, lush fruit. And by the way, it's never said to be an apple. We just have put that into the picture. But it's a fruit, a, a plant or a food that's good for food. It's going to nourish me. It's going to give me wisdom. It's going to give me knowledge. And I'm going to be like God! Ah! Boy, howdy. Isn't that what we all want to do? Control our own destiny? Be our own boss and not have to listen to somebody else? You see, up on the upper level, God has been trying, had, had given a certain stipulation so that the man and the woman, so that you and I would not fall into temptation. He wanted to maintain a relationship. And he knew that as soon as the man and the woman ate of the fruit, that there was going to be a separation between him and them. I want to control my own destiny. And as soon as they ate, as soon as the man and the woman ate, they knew they were naked. They knew that something had changed. They looked at each other, and rather than looking at the 
nakedness of the other person in innocence, now they look at each other and they see themselves naked and open. And they sought to cover themselves, to hide themselves, to hide the embarrassment of what was probably uh, the, the human body, because before that there was no, before the eating there was no embarrassment. They covered themselves. And that night when God came to fellowship with them, they hid from God. They were afraid to be in God's presence because they were naked. And God sought them out. And He challenged them. And when they came out, they had to admit and confess that they had been disobedient to God. They had hidden themselves from their Creator. They had hidden themselves from the God who had, they had been in fellowship with up until that very day. There was nothing that separated them from God. Other than the fact that God was in the upper level and they were on the lower level. But God would come to them and they could talk with God and they could speak with God face to face as it were. And they did that. But as soon as they sinned, there was a separation. There was a dividing line. And God had them confess their sin. And as with most humans, when we do something wrong, we tend to blame it on somebody else. We can blame it on, as Adam and Eve did, we can, they can blame, they tried to blame it on the serpent. Eve tried to blame it on the serpent. Adam tried to blame it on Eve, and then he said, hey, God, it's not my fault. You gave her to me. It's your fault, God. You, you gave this beautiful woman to me, and now she's led me astray. Not my fault. And God comes. And not only did God punish the serpent and did God punish the man and the woman, but all of creation was punished. Because that beautiful place that God had created, where the water sprang up and people were fed and, and were able just to, to go out and, and, and get their food, now they have to toil for their food. It's, it's going to be hard work. It's going to be cutting the ground, cutting up, plowing the sod, and planting the seed, and, and, and waiting for the, for the plants to grow, and, and keeping the weeds out. All kinds of things happen to the creation. And then, God did something. Because the man and the woman had sinned on page 7 of our book, at the very top in the last paragraph, we find these words. After He drove the man out of the Garden of Eden, He placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. You see, there were two trees in that garden. One was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was a tree that man and a woman could not eat of. But there was another tree that God didn't say anything about but it was a tree of life. God knew that if the man and the woman were to go to the tree of life and to take it, to take whatever the fruit was on that tree and eat it, they were going to live forever separated from Him. Think about that. God had created the man and the woman so that He could have fellowship with them and they could fellowship with Him and, 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 and there could be a relationship established. But now that they had sinned, that relationship was separated and, and God knew 
that if they ate of the tree of life, that they were going to live forever in their sin. They would be forever separated from Him. God had no desire for mankind to be separated from Him. To suffer and to live a life that has no meaning, has no direction. So God said, I am going to shut the door so that the man and the woman cannot go and eat of the tree of life and live forever. God pronounced judgment upon the man and the woman. He told them what was going to happen for the rest of their lives. But He says, I'm not going to leave you separated from me. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to shut the door so that you cannot ever be tempted to eat of the tree of life and live forever in your sin. I'm going to be merciful to you. I'm going to take that temptation away. The next time we see the tree of life mentioned in the Bible, mentioned in Scripture, is in the book of Revelation. When the people that have accepted Jesus and have accepted and believed in God through faith, when they will be living forever in heaven in fellowship. God said, you cannot eat of the tree of life now, but you will eat of it eventually when we are all together in this church. Adam and Eve had children. The children sinned. Some sinned far worse than the others. And it got to a point in time where God looked down from the heavens and He looked at the earth and He saw that the earth was full of wickedness. That there was no man, no people, no, no group of human beings that were not doing wrong. The earth was full of sin. And the Scripture says that, that God was upset and He repented of the fact that He had created man and woman. He, he, he regretted, uh, that, and that's a human term, but, but He looked and He saw that Everything was evil. And God said, I'm going to start again. He says, this is not good. I'm going to start again. And so God went to a man by the name of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. Noah was a man who continued to worship God in faithfulness. And God spoke to Noah. And He said, Noah, He says, this world that, that, that I have created is... It is full of evil. There is nothing good happening down here. And I'm going to destroy the earth. I'm going to bring a flood to the earth. And so Noah speaks with, or God speaks to Noah. And he says, Noah, I am going to destroy the earth, but you are righteous in my sight. And I am going to save you and your family, but in order to do that, I need you to create and make a big boat. Because when I destroy the earth, I'm going to do it by bringing a flood of water. And for 400 years, Noah builds the ark. And while he is building the ark, he is speaking to the people around him and he is saying to them, God is bringing judgment, repent. And for 400 years, no one repented. And God's judgment of the earth was to kill everything on the earth. Every man, every woman, all of the cattle, all of the wild beasts, all of the creatures that slither on the earth, all of the fish, all of the birds of the air, everything that God has spoken into creation, He says, I am going to kill. And He starts the rain. God directs the animals 
at least two of the animals to, uh, uh, that he had created to go into the ark. Noah didn't go up and round them up. God sent them, male and female, of every kind of living creature on the earth, into the ark. There were seven pairs of clean animals. We don't understand at this point in time in the story about clean and unclean animals, but God did, and when He gave us the story, He told us that there was going to be seven pairs of clean animals because there was only the clean animals that could be eaten or sacrificed to Him. God fills the ark with all of the animals, with two of every kind of animal, and then God shuts the door. If you look on page 9, I believe it is. Uh, oh, wait a minute. I had the door. Oh, yeah, page 9. Down on the very bottom of page 9. The animals. Last paragraph, last full paragraph says, the animals going in were male and female of every living thing as God had commanded them. Then the Lord shut him in. The Lord shut the door. The Lord closed the door on the ark. Just as He closed the door to the tree of life, now God closes the door so that those who are sinners will die. He places His judgment upon the earth. He shuts Noah and his family in. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And those four men and their wives went into the ark. God shuts the door. And judgment falls on all sinners. Now Noah was a sinner also, but he was a righteous man. He was one who walked and talked and spoke with God and believed in God and worshipped God. And God says, I am going to use the family of Noah to start all over again. You see, we have the upper level story of what God is doing and we have the lower level story of what man is doing. And then you have your story and my story. You see, we're tempted in the same way that Adam and Eve were tempted. We're challenged. Did God really say this? We're challenged to understand God and not to put extra things on God's Word. Extra understanding. We're challenged. Is God really truthful or is He a liar? We look at all of these things around us and, and, and all of the different temptations that we have and, and we see that, hey, it looks like it's good for food. It looks like it's something that's going to make me wise. It looks like something that's, that's, that's going to, to, to give me life. And I can be my own boss. Each and out of every one of us has sinned. We have fallen short of the glory of God. And God has said that when you sin, there's going to be judgment. But God has also said that in judgment, there is also mercy and grace. And we Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And we find grace in the eyes of the Lord by believing in Him and as Noah and his family did, believing in God. We learn later in time when Jesus comes that we go to God through Jesus. But it's always by faith. Faith in the truthfulness of God's Word and walking in a relationship with Him. The upper level story says that God cares for us. The lower level story says we can care for God or we can reject God and try to become our own lives. 
your story and my story is what is our relationship? What is my relationship with the God who created us? That's the challenge that you and I face. Do we trust God? Or do we trust science or other things in this life? The only way to have a right relationship is with God is through His direction and through faith in Him. Let us pray. Father, your story is a mighty story. You care for us. You designed us so that we as humans could have a relationship with you. That we can commune with you. That we can come before you and speak to you as Father, as Creator, as Sustainer, as Redeemer, as Savior. Thank you, Father, for your love for us. Thank you that as you judge the world for the sin, that you also have grace and mercy upon those who believe in you. Help us to draw closer to you and understanding of you in our lives. Lord, it is in your Son's precious name.